In 1958, when the Westminster Theological Seminary moved from its campus on Western Maryland College to Washington, D.C., there were great expectations for its future. From its beginnings in 1882, the seminary's principal mission was to prepare its graduates for ministry. With the move to Washington, the institution not only changed its name to Wesley Theological Seminary, but it also began a subtle transformation in its mission that would start to flower a century after its founding. By 1982, Wesley's enrollment had grown substantially, and despite a well-earned reputation for outstanding theological education, the seminary faced some serious difficulties as its new president, Doug Lewis, began his term. I had been working three or four months behind the scenes with board members doing a number of things that, uh, as it turned out, were very critical to uh, helping Wesley to begin to right the ship. I think most people knew that uh, Wesley had some difficulties financially. What they didn't know was how difficult it was. Uh, to give you some concrete illustration of that, they had been running a deficit for seven years. They had a $2 million uh, endowment, which they'd spent a million three of, and they, so they had about $700,000 in the bank. And the last year before I came, they had a $369,000 deficit out of a $3 million budget. So that the, for the future was not bright, financially speaking. Everybody was, uh, faculty and others were aware of that, but nobody quite knew how serious or what to do about it. Um, very soon after he became president, he gathered the faculty and told us that he had discovered we were in a deep financial crisis. That had not been shared with the faculty. We weren't aware of the depth of that crisis. We knew that Wesley was really, um, you know, in a bind. Um, and that's why I say that divine, that God loved Wesley. I, I tell people today God loved Wesley because that was a crucial time that Wesley could have been shut down. Um, things were really bad. Some people can reach out to people. Some people know. Some people are, um, bringing people that didn't know can help them. And, um, and I think when you change people on the Board of Governors and change people's mentality and, and um, make decision that tough decision, very tough decision, um, but it was always for the benefit of the whole. And I, I believe when he was able to do all those things and, and, and not waver whatsoever because he know it was for the benefit of the whole. Um, things really began to prosper. We balanced the budget the first year. And uh, I, one of the critical moments of that was, and, and it was not any one thing. We were fortunate that we had a good, strong enrollment. We raised a lot more money. We controlled our expenses, et cetera. But about June the 15th, I remember, our fiscal year ends June 30. I, one Saturday morning, I got a call from Helen Smith. She was later chair. She was a member of the board. And Gordon, her husband, had been on the search committee who chose me. And Helen said, Gordon and I were just sitting here drinking coffee and talking about Wesley and how things are going well. How close are we to balancing the budget? I said, well, Helen, we count this every day. And I said, the best we can tell, we're about $50,000 short. She said, would it help if Gordon and I gave $15,000? I said, well, yes, that would. <laughs> so on Monday morning, we sent out this letter saying we've had a challenge grant to try to finish this year. And in two weeks, we received $60,000. And we balanced the budget for the first year. And Wesley had 20 years of, of balanced budgets from that point on. He, he certainly had uh, the governance that he was going to need to make the seminary grow wasn't in place. And he almost single-handedly went out and recruited the new 
the new people who would be the, the, the supporters of the seminary? Uh, the meetings were uh, with a good agenda. Uh, we had the right people on the board, the right mix, in my view. And that mix is pretty impressive. And I, I like the educational milieu. I like the church milieu. And all of that seemed to come together in a sort of a pseudo-business way uh, in seminaries. So when uh, Ken Million uh, asked me to come on the seminary board, I was tickled to death. There weren't a lot of things I would have done while I was still a sitting governor at the Fed, but I couldn't pass that up. People did get very involved, and I think there were two groups that came together that really were very invested in Wesley, and th there were the board members. Some of those board members were also members of Wesley Council, but I think each of us brought in other people that we knew. I think one of the things that, that part of my vision and part of the vision that was already here at Wesley was to help to create a diverse institution. And I think the theme we used to talk about is we want to have an educational institution where people live and learn and love with people who are different than they are. And that that's part of what our world is, was becoming. And so we had to prepare people for that kind of world. And it was not just, um, um, you can't just offer courses on it. You have to be that kind of community. And that's why we really worked at building a diverse community. That hiring more diverse faculty helped us attract a more diverse student body. But we also need to be honest, there are seminaries with good intentions on that that have trouble following through on them. We're fortunate to be in Washington, D.C. So the, the pool of potential students is richly diverse. So in, in part, it was both fortunate and an intentional strategy to reflect the setting where we are. The diversity of the faculty and the diversity of the student body really kind of went hand in hand. One of the things that I will never forget this faculty for, Nelson Mandela was still in, in jail in South Africa. Apartheid was still being practiced in South Africa as the law. There were all kinds of protests against apartheid, including not investing in South Africa and so on. And I felt that the faculty at Western Seminary needed to make a witness and to make a statement about apartheid. Now, <laughs> I, had a little, I had a little convincing to do to get the faculty to do this. <laughs> Doug helped. Doug, Doug Lewis helped. Uh, he saw the justice issue involved. And as I said, he, you know, I said, now, Doug, you know, you're supposed to be a, an authority on conflict management now. <laughs> We've got a conflict here, and we need to protest. We need to protest the injustice. Uh, well, anyway, make a long story short, the whole faculty was arrested in the city of Washington uh, protesting apartheid in South Africa. Uh, Doug made a difference. He was a leader, and, uh, and Doug listened to the faculty. He listened to his faculty. He knew, and he, well, at least he learned, if he didn't know before he got there, he learned the most important thing on a theological school, in a th theological school, is its faculty. Doug Lewis intended to move this seminary back into greater proximity with the church and greater, um, a greater ability to speak the native language of faith of the surrounding communities. And he set out to do that. And he hired Doug Meeks as a dean and supported that cluster of faculty that came in. We were, I was one of the first four, but not by any means the last. I could you know, name off on my fingers the others who came in succession. But I would say that the language of faith and conviction and scholarship that we spoke was not Doug Lewis's own native language. It was his judgment about what the seminary needed to do and to become to thrive. Doug Meeks had been dean one year, maybe two years, and Doug had a vision for making Wesley a much more church-based seminary so that its relationship was going to be 
um, collaborative and uh, I think the phrase that we were using was a church-based seminary. And uh, that was not a vision that everybody was um, comfortable with because uh, another model is that you've got you know, the, the seminary standing prophetically outside and beyond the church. And Doug's vision was a much closer intimate partnership. And so it was uh, a time of um, where Doug was rallying people to that mission and it was being contested by others as well. Um, over time, what happened is Doug's uh, and Doug Meeks and Doug Lewis's vision for the seminary prevailed and uh, I think it got internalized by the faculty, the students, the administration. And it uh, didn't happen overnight, but it, it was a vision that people believed in and I think it, in time it really took root. It's a very different, you have, when you come to Wesley, you, you experience all kinds of different people, different ages, different uh, uh, racial, ethnic, uh, different theological backgrounds, et cetera. So you can't, you can't uh, not be confronted with people who are different than you are here. And that was one of our visions. So that was one of the things we worked on. Wesley what isn't just Methodist or Baptist, but we've got, I don't know how many different uh, denominations involved here now and even some secular students who said they're just coming to get a deeper understanding of spirituality. So to interact with people from all of these different walks of life, all the different economic uh, sectors, people who came with varied experiences and to see that we could all leave this place with a common kind of common understanding that however we define service, if we're doing it to the glory of God, then God accepts that. He accepts us where we are. The Art Center was in an infant stage when I came here. Uh, Kathy Kapikian showed up in my office shortly after I arrived and informed me of all the things that I needed to do <laughs> for the arts. And I would say that what, what made the arts was the, was the partnership Kathy and I had together. She was the creative genius behind it. I was a layperson in the arts. But what I did was I provided the institutional support and affirmation for, for that to happen. Kathy always said, an artist is not a special kind of person, but every person's a special kind of artist. And we were not about training artists here. We were about helping people be in touch with their own creativity and imagination. And that's why it's part of a theological school, because we're about helping people be in touch with their calling, their imagination, their gifts, whatever they are. And Doug Lewis comes. He um, looked around and saw the art studio and what students were doing. And uh, he looked around and he said, oh, he said, I would like to have a big exhibition for my installation as president. I said to myself, oh, boy. Maybe I have an ally. So I did. I got all kinds of student work and had a wonderful exhibition for his installation. And then I don't know how long after that he called me into his office and said he wanted to create a center for the arts. In the beginning, it was really just the visual arts, and music always had a place here. I brought in the visual arts, but once they were here, then it was a question of bringing in, 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 in drama and dance. Mm -hmm because it's really, these are the multiple languages of worship. And theological proclamation comes vis-a-vis -vis all of these languages. You know, I think, I think I loved every day of being president. It was the most fun thing I've ever done in my life. And uh, it was not that it wasn't hard sometimes or that I did it perfectly every time, but it was, it was a great thing, as I used to say, I would see a miracle a week. I would see somebody or something that had transformative power to it, that something happened for them. And it would, could be a faculty member, it could be a student, it could be a board member, and you know, I've got countless stories about that. But, but to be able to see that happen in people's lives, and for me to be kind of a facilitator, not, I didn't cause it, I just helped it to happen, and that's really gratifying. That's really fun, um, even, <laughs> even when you have to do the hard stuff. If you believe that that's what's, 
is good for the whole institution, then you have to be satisfied with that. Having David McAllister Wilson succeed me uh, and the confidence that Wesley was on track, that it had a board that was willing to step out and make that decision, and a person who I had great confidence in to follow that, I would say maybe that was certainly my decision of, of retirement and how we handled the transition was, I thought, extremely important for the future of the institution. I see a lot of Doug and David, and so there's no way that you can work so closely with somebody for 20 years and not be shaped in your own way of, of leading. But I think the strengths of that far outweigh, you know, whatever weaknesses there may be in that continuity because continuity is so hard to have in a theological school where at any time 40% of seminary presidents will have been there less than, than three years and only 10 to 20% will have been there more than 10 years. So to have not only a 20-year presidency but then have that continued with much of the same DNA has been a tremendous advantage. I knew that Doug was retiring. I knew that that could be the end of my time at Wesley. Um, we have had chapters at Wesley uh, that run about four to five years. And I knew it was the end of a chapter. I didn't know if it was the end of the book. I didn't know what would happen, and I was uh, really surprised when they uh, came to see me and tell me that uh, they'd made this decision. When David took it on, it was ready to bloom. David had thought about it a lot, had very good sound ideas about what that blooming should consist of. Well, in that year of transition, uh, that th the most obvious challenge was 9-11. And that was, of course, a challenge for the country and for other parts of Washington. But it also became a real challenge to this city um, and to, the, to this seminary uh, because we have always seen Washington as one of our strengths. And some people said in those days, well, your enrollment's going to be hurt. Uh, because people will be afraid to come to Washington. But um, I felt at the time, and still do, uh, we want the students who want to come to Washington. So uh, rather than downplay our location, that was going to be a time when we uh, focused on it. We were facing a period of great struggle within the mainline Protestant church to figure out what it its mission is and, and how it can thrive in the 21st century. So we started a strategic planning process and we decided to have as that plan a very long range vision for what the church would be in the middle of the next, of this century. So we called it Ministry 2044, it's just right in the middle. And in that plan we set out a vision for uh, how we would respond to the challenges of the time, which was the Im immediate challenge of crisis uh, on a national and international level, but then a deeper challenge uh, to the church. When everybody else was retrenching, this board doubled down and, and took some pretty aggressive steps in investments for the future. And uh, with God's grace, it worked. So decisions made for re relating to increased uh, uh, financial aid for younger folks because we wanted to increase the percent of younger folks uh, who were attending Wesley, um, increased commitment uh, in, in term and planning for uh, the, leader, the Lewis Leadership Center, which I'm proud to have a part in, and, and uh, the downtown campus and everything else, the new dorm, occurred during a period when most um, uh, seminaries were scared stiff of doing anything. Because so many of our board members have caused us to think bigger and to be smarter about what we do. 
So I have found that the board at Wesley is, and my relationship to them, is probably the most important factor that has enabled us to uh, change and develop and thrive in this time. The Lewis Leadership Center, as an idea, started in Doug Lewis's first year uh, when he had hired Lovett Weems as vice president and they had hired me to, to work with them. And at the time, we knew uh, that the institution was really struggling. And so we started reading um, some of the early books on leadership. And we read them with an eye towards how would this research help us with the seminary? And how does it help us prepare leaders for the church? Somewhere along the line, Doug Lewis started talking about, wouldn't it be great if we had some kind of a center? So as he was getting set to retire, we started putting together the idea of a center. And as we uh, did that, unbeknownst to Doug, I started talking to some people about the possibility of some startup funds to get it going. And in a few months, we raised a million dollars to start the center. We still have that million dollars because the center has been so successful. Our idea was that it would be, as I put it, the business school for the church. And that is what it's become. And it has become such an important resource for pastors, for lay people, uh, for congregations to uh, receive actionable strategic insights, that the funding has come in through a series of grants and gifts, and most importantly, uh, fees for service that has caused this to be really unique in theological education. There's nothing that approaches what the Leadership Center does. And it's a result of the leadership of Lovett Weems, who came back to Wesley, having been a seminary president himself, uh, to head up the center. And so, in a way, this sort of comes full circle on all of Wesley's history and all that we've tried to be. We had talked for years about we ought to make Wesley a more vital place in the nation's capital. While we sat in the richest part of D.C., in northwest D.C., where the people who live out there uh, are, are, are kind of different than the people who live in southeast D.C. So something had to be done about that. And then uh, thanks to people like Earl Stafford and Mike McCurry and others, uh, Wesley got serious about moving a campus downtown. The two congregations in Wesley Seminary agreed to have a partnership. And that partnership meant Wesley would expand its programs and have offices downtown. We also have 17 students living in uh, space in that renovated building. So we own a part of the building. And more importantly, we own the mission of revitalizing churches downtown. But the really breakthrough things have been conversations I've had with board members about what we ought to be doing. Um, I think of conversations I had with Marty Carr, who really said, you have to do something about your dorm. I didn't want to build a dorm. I thought, we don't need to spend time and money on that. It turned out to be very essential. Well, it's just, as a mother of six children, you just kind of look at the housekeeping type things and um, I couldn't believe that all these kids came to Wesley, especially in the summertime. No air conditioning. They finally ended up getting some window air conditioning, but they all rely so much on their computers and everything. And it, they just, you know, the wiring was not sufficient and and then there were leaks and, you know, they just needed to get into the modern world. So I don't think David really wanted that, but enough people did. And so we now have this lovely new dorm. I think the key to Wesley's success is that we practice shared leadership and shared vision. There is 
no good idea at Wesley that comes from the president's office. It's the result of a lot of people. And not every week, but maybe twice a month, somebody comes to my office with a good idea. And so we try to incorporate everybody's vision so that it's a shared vision. And that means we need to have shared leadership. So people like Lovett Weems in the Leadership Center, people like Vice President Kyung Lim Shin Lee in our global initiatives, there's so many others. But the one who has made the most difference in this period of our growth and our flowering as an institution has been Bruce Birch, who served uh, for a combined total of 12 years as the Dean of Wesley. Uh, Bruce not only led the faculty, but he was a partner uh, with me to dream about the institution and make things possible that most seminaries would find impossible. The relationship of the board to the faculty has also been important. And there are some institutions where those two entities are kept apart. Our faculty are an extraordinary group of men and women, uh, not just as teachers and scholars, but they also care about the future of the seminary. So the, the conversations board members and faculty have together, we structure those conversations, make sure we give those that an opportunity, have been a part of how everybody's on the same page at Wesley. They may not agree with everything on the page, but uh, we're all moving in the same direction. You know, one of the things I know about the Wesley board is they're highly accomplished people, but they're, they're church people. They're people who, you know, m make commitment to attending church, contributing to the life of the church, finances, service, that's an important part of who they are. And uh, so I, I, I feel a, a strong sense of collaborative, you know, collaboration with the board members that I've gotten to know. There are those who, who perhaps didn't as clearly see the vision who might have been more reluctant or reticent uh, uh, in moving forward. And there are other visionaries such as David and Mike McCurry and others who saw the possibilities of what could happen when we reached out and we stepped out on faith. And uh, I think that attitude, that perspective prevailed. Well, there are, there are a number of things that this seminary has done to really reflect both our presence here in Washington and then kind of the global perspective we have. But let me give you a couple of examples. In addition to kind of really bringing students into the life of the Urban Center and really understanding how urban communities tick through you know getting them involved in feeding programs and public health uh, service providing and really understanding how communities function we also have a this amazing global uh, connection which uh, because we are so close to the Korean Methodist Church and we have a strong Korean presence within our student body uh, that that forces us almost to kind of take advantage of the opportunities we have to think more globally about the church Wesley is in a very good position to contribute ourselves to the theological education of the world. First of all, our faculty is very aware of the needs of the world and well, well connected. And our board members and our, our graduates as well. And our staff is willing to go extra miles because most of this global uh, work it takes extraordinary ways to deal with that. Our staff has been very helpful for that. When I came to Wesley, I realized that one doesn't need to teach only to the head. Of course, I was interested in the life of the mind, but I was interested in God claiming one's life itself to be set free for the world in service. And I found at Wesley, Everyone that came into the classroom needed to be convinced, but they also were willing to allow their hearts to be shaped in such a way that they would then be empowered to do something about the problems in the world, to reach out in the name of Jesus Christ. And when I taught here, I felt if I come back ever, it would be to an institution like this that weaves together heart, head, but also empowers the hands and strengthens the feet to go out into the world 
to do what we are called to do, which is to announce good news, but also to live out the possibilities of this good news in the name of Jesus Christ. Regardless of who the staff person is, regardless of what department they work in, they always give 110%. And, 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 and I know that because I interact with all of them. Um, they all have to have something mailed. They all have to have something cut. They all have to do this. So I see that, that, that spirit of, yes, I'm going to make sure I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, I'm gonna give it 110%. I will, if I have to stay late, I'll do that. If I have to come in early, I'll do that. If I have to do it over the lunch, I'll do that. But that spirit is always there, and that spirit is nothing but a godly spirit. And, and that's because um, they wanna make sure that Wesley light continue to shine. I hope all of the things we intend for this institution as a leading institution just continue to grow and mature so that in this period when a lot of seminaries are in trouble, when the church is asking what's going to happen next, that we emerge from that looking backwards as one of the few seminaries that really defined what the new church looks like as a church that's both uh, humble and confident in the expression of the gospel, which is engaged in the world uh, in a hopeful and creative way, uh, which causes people to see in our graduates and the churches they serve the face and the hands and feet of Jesus.